Living or vacationing on an island is a unique experience since you're removed from the hustle and bustle of the mainland and usually get to spend time with a tight-knit community. Most of us see this as an idyllic way of living, but some islands are more mysterious than others and are known to be home to some very strange and unsolved cases, some of which are decades old and may never be solved. Number 10. Potatoes are one of the most versatile foods on Earth. Not only are they relatively easy to grow, but they go well with a variety of dishes and also make a tasty meal on their own. Not to mention being the main ingredient in one of the world's favorite snacks, potato chips. But as is evidenced by a few cases between 2014 and 2017, potatoes are also an easy food to tamper with though it's hard to fathom why anyone would wish to do so, since an innocent victim could be easily injured if they were to ingest one of them. Though thankfully, this was not the case during these particular incidents. The first of these cases took place in 2014 on Prince Edward Island, which is situated about 120 miles from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Six people contacted the police in the span of just seven days to report that they'd found metal objects in their potatoes. When an investigation was launched, it was found that the objects were sewing needles and it's believed that they were placed inside the potatoes on purpose. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police stated that all of the tampered with potatoes originated from Linkletter Farms in Summerside on the island and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency was immediately informed. Linkletter Farms quickly withdrew its potatoes from store shelves to avoid further similar incidents and consumers were informed that they should inspect their potatoes before eating them, in case more needles were found inside. The following year, three people reported in a short span of time that they'd found metal objects in potatoes that they'd purchased, the first of which was bought at the Montague Atlantic Superstore on Prince Edward Island. Investigators declined to name which brand of potatoes the objects were found in, since this could lead to the brand unfairly gaining a bad reputation. Just one day later, a man found another potato that had been tampered with, stating that he found a nail inside and he took it to a local police station to file a report. This time, the potato in question was bought at the Atlantic Superstore and on this occasion, they revealed that it was a farmer's market brand potato and that it had been bought in either April or May. The third incident took place in Barrington Passage at a no-frills grocery store. A customer returned a bag of potatoes that they bought there after they also discovered a nail inside one of the potatoes, and it was quickly becoming apparent that this was no mere coincidence. The same scenario played out in 2016 and 2017, when needles were found in potatoes bought in Halifax, Newfoundland, Labrador, and Neils Harbor in Nova Scotia. In each of these cases, the investigation was handed over to the RCMP's Major Crime and Forensic Testing Unit. It's remarkable that no one was injured during any of these cases, since we don't usually check our food for foreign objects before eating. Despite a thorough investigation, the culprit was never identified, and only time will tell if they ever will be. Number 9. The island of Spina Longa is situated in northeastern Crete, and it has a very interesting history. Between the years of 1903 and 1957, it was used as a leper colony where people afflicted by the disease were sent to ensure that they were isolated from the rest of the population, likely because it was erroneously thought to be highly contagious. Not many people are aware of the fact that only prolonged exposure to someone with leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, could result in an infection, but those afflicted by it have been subject to isolation throughout history, likely due to a lack of knowledge of the disease. At first, it was believed that leprosy was hereditary and that it would eventually manifest in children of the sufferers. But when it eventually came to light that it was actually a bacterial infection, its victims were removed from the general population. Those who were found to be suffering from leprosy in Greece were sent to Spinalonga Island, and it would be decades before proper research would reveal that these people should not be treated as outcasts, but rather treated with the correct medication since it is curable. The island can only be reached via boat and annually sees around 400,000 people traveling there to see the 400-year-old Venetian fortifications that are still present there. In 2018, though, the island was the unlikely site of a robbery and to this day, the culprits have not been identified. 
The robbery was likely made possible by the fact that there was no electricity on the island at the time, and security was non-existent at night. During the day, generators are used to provide the island with power, since it's usually inundated with tourists. But as soon as they head back to the mainland, the generators are switched off, and security guards leave for home at 6.30 p.m., leaving the island dark and completely uninhabited. The thieves in this case obviously knew of this schedule and took full advantage of it. They used battery-powered tools to break into a building, where the take from tourist ticket sales was being kept, and made off with as much as $58,000, a massive haul for what must have been just a few minutes of work. An investigation was immediately launched after the missing money was reported, but there are very few clues to follow, and it's unlikely that the thieves will ever be identified, though it is believed that they live in the surrounding area, since they had enough knowledge of the island to investigate there in the dark. The crime has had an unexpected positive outcome, though. In November of 2023, it was announced that work would be started to connect the island to Plaka on the mainland via an underwater cable. This is being done not only as a security measure, but to bring the island's infrastructure up to date for visiting tourists. This might also mean that security staff could work night shifts on the island, which would dramatically lower the chances of further robberies being carried out there. In the aftermath of the robbery, authorities asked anyone with information to come forward, but no one did, and hence the thieves remain on the loose, and could easily be tempted to repeat their crime since they got away scot-free. Hopefully, this will bring about the change that's needed on the island, and it can be transformed into a tourist attraction like it should be. Number 8. Bali in Indonesia is seen as one of the most idyllic vacation destinations in the world, as it boasts magnificent sea views, lush jungles that can be freely explored, huge volcanoes that have lain dormant for a very long time, and beautiful waterfalls, as well as rich cultural background. But one of the most popular attractions on the island is one that has been abandoned for a very long time. A hotel sits on the island and is slowly being overrun by the surrounding trees and foliage. Though not much is known about the construction of the hotel, some believe that it was the brainchild of members of the Indonesian royalty, though there's no evidence to support this theory. Others think that it was originally constructed by Tommy Suharto, the son of the former president of Indonesia, who had a less than enviable reputation, since he was known to be corrupt and would often be accused of nepotism. It's said that Suardo started construction on the hotel during the 1990s, but before it could be completed, his corrupt ways caught up with him and he was taken into custody, bringing the project to a halt. He would attempt to flee but was quickly tracked down and found guilty of a slew of charges, and hence the hotel has never been completed. It now slowly decays as no further work has ever been done, and currently there are no plans to do so. Thanks to the eerie appearance of the hotel, many people believe that it's haunted or that something otherworldly dwells within its unfinished walls, and there are many reports to back this theory up. One such tale claims that the hotel was full of guests and construction workers one night, but they mysteriously and inexplicably disappeared. Those who believe this theory state that their spirits were left behind and that they still haunt the building to this day. Another tale states that the workers who were employed to complete the construction of the building were forced to work around the clock and they became so exhausted that they eventually collapsed. Their ghosts are said to still walk through the building and this legend is so well known that taxi drivers will often refuse to enter the hotel's grounds when dropping tourists off since they believe these malicious spirits might harm them. This has also attracted the attention of ghost hunters, who can regularly be seen conducting investigations in the hotel, in hopes that they'll capture something paranormal on camera, though they've been unsuccessful so far. It's also been speculated that the site is cursed thanks to the corrupt ways of Suardo, and that this is the reason why it's never been completed. Most people who visit the area feel that the project should be taken up once more and completed, but it seems that there aren't any plans to do so at present. Though it's hard to find any specific accounts of hauntings in the hotel, it's clear that its eerie reputation is very much intact, as most locals refuse to go anywhere near it, and it remains closed to members of the public. But it is apparently possible to gain entry, 
since security guards will allow visitors for a fee of around $1. It's also been suggested that tours may be scheduled at the hotel in the future, but for now, it remains an eerie and abandoned site that only the bravest of explorers dare enter and investigate. Number 7. The Canary Islands are also a hugely popular tourist destination, with Tenerife being one of the most famous. Since it has a moderate climate, offers amazing sea views, and boasts a huge volcano that can be seen from just about anywhere on the island. It's also where the Barranco de Badajos, a ravine in Weimar, is situated, and many people believe that it's haunted since there have been many reports of paranormal activity that takes place there. Probably the most famous and often told tale is that of a young girl who walked to the ravine many years ago in the early 1900s but she didn't return home when expected and she was reported missing. An investigation was launched and the area was thoroughly searched, but no sign of the girl was ever found and it seemed that her fate would remain unknown forever until something truly strange happened. Decades after she went missing, the girl suddenly reappeared and to the shock of those who knew her, they discovered that she hadn't aged at all despite being gone for all that time. Naturally, they were curious to hear what had happened to her and she explained it as the following. She stated that her parents had asked her to get some fruit from the ravine, as she'd done on many occasions before. And after picking a few pears, she sat down under the tree to have a rest, but she fell asleep. She was then woken up by a tall, white being that she'd never seen before. Strangely, she wasn't frightened at all, and so readily agreed to follow the creature into a nearby cave, which had a ladder placed inside it. They then climbed down the ladder to a beautiful garden, where she saw several more of these beings that were dressed in white robes. She felt at home here and so decided to spend a few minutes in their company before being taken back to the cave's entrance by the first being that she met. In her mind, she'd only been away from home for a short time, maybe a few hours. But when she returned home, she discovered that decades had inexplicably passed and she had no plausible explanation. Another well-known tale is that a group of miners who were working in the cave in 1912 were in one of the galleries in the ravine, which was suddenly flooded with water. This caused a wall near them to fall over, and when they looked beyond it, they realized that a large area which was concealed behind it was now exposed. A few moments later, several tall beings approached them and told them where they could continue to dig in order to find water but no one knows where these beings came from or whether they lived in the ravine permanently. But there's yet another strange case that took place there decades later in 1991. It's said that on the 1st of July of that year, a group of people were exploring the ravine when they suddenly became aware of the sound of massive wings flapping above them. But they struggled to see where it was coming from since it was very dark. One of them had a camera with them and started taking photos of the area where the sound was coming from. And the resulting photo is seen by many as proof that the area is home to a massive winged creature with the face of a human. These sightings have convinced many people that the Barranco de Badajos contains a doorway to another dimension and that this is why strange things keep happening there. Number 6. The Loch Ness Monster is known all across the globe despite there being a lack of conclusive evidence that it even exists. But there are thousands of people who are convinced that it still swims beneath the waters of the lake. And in 2023, a group of people from the Loch Ness Center and the Loch Ness Exploration set out to find it. They made use of the latest technology to scan the lake, including thermal drones that would look for distinctive heat signatures, and a hydrophone that would pick up any unusual sounds originating from the lake. Some investigators took to the water in boats to carry out their investigations, while others monitored the water from the lake's shores. Several strange sounds were heard coming from a particular area in the lake, but when that same area was investigated again the next day, nothing was found. In the end, the team failed to find any concrete proof that Nessie exists, but they are still reviewing the mountain of data that was collected. And in the meantime, a man in Australia took a photo of a creature in the water off Magnetic Island that bears a striking resemblance to the one rumored to live in Loch Ness. The creature was first spotted by a group of people who were spending time on the island's picnic bay. They described it as having a very long curved neck and that it seemed to be bobbing up and down in the water, 
leading many people to believe that it was merely a log or a hull of a boat that sunk there some time ago. But a man named David Heron, who was celebrating his marriage on the island, then grabbed his camera after noticing the commotion and took a photo of the creature, which was about 600 feet from the shore. He stated that he had never seen anything like it before and that he was very curious to find out exactly what it was. He added that it instantly reminded him of the Loch Ness Monster, since it seemed to be swimming through the water with its head held high, much like in the famous photo taken at Loch Ness in 1934 by Dr. Robert Kenneth Wilson, which is now known as the surgeon's photograph. Heron stated that as soon as the figure was spotted in the water, people on the shore became very excited, and they immediately started speculating as to what it was that they were seeing with some people suggesting that it could be a large bird or the remnants of a dragon boat that never made it back to land. But Heron has stated that he's convinced that this is the Loch Ness Monster that has traveled all the way to Australia in search of warmer weather. Others think that the creature may be a close relative of Nessie's and that it may have been living in the area for a very long time without ever being spotted. Though the surgeon's photograph was later revealed to be a cleverly orchestrated hoax, Heron's photo is certainly real, since there are several witnesses present when he took it, most of whom also believe that it shows some kind of creature swimming through the water. Whether this really is a Loch Ness type animal that's been caught on camera remains to be seen, and will only receive possible answers once further investigations are carried out, but at present it isn't known whether any are planned. Number 5. When we hear the word Hobbit, most of us instantly think of the books authored by J.R.R. Tolkien, in which we're introduced to a race of tiny human-like creatures that live in houses built in the hills in their surrounding countryside. We all know that this is a work of fiction, but thanks to a discovery made in the Leongboa Cave in Indonesia in 2003, many people believe that a similar race of people lived a very long time ago, but that they've been extinct for about 50,000 years. During an excavation led by archaeologist Mike Moorwood, over 100 of these fossils were discovered, and it's now believed that they belonged to a species of human called Homo floresiensis, a distant relative of Homo erectus. Thanks to studies that have since been conducted, it's believed that they lived between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago, and that they stood around 3.3 feet high. They're also said to have had small skulls, pronounced brow ridges, short legs, and large feet, much like the hobbits in Tolkien's tales. As for the size of their brains, they're thought to have been much smaller than those of modern humans, measuring around 65 square inches. Thanks to these measurements, it's thought that they weighed an average of about 55 pounds, though no evidence has been found to indicate what they were in the habit of eating. Strangely, Liangba Cave is the only area where any of these fossils have ever been found, and hence it's believed that they lived on Flores Island in isolation, which may offer an explanation as to why they eventually went extinct. It's also possible that Homo floresiensis became extinct before modern humans arrived in the area, since no modern humans have been uncovered during the excavation. At first, it was speculated that the fossils belonged to a more modern child, but when it was further scrutinized, it was found to have fully developed wisdom teeth, and then became clear that the remains belonged to adults. It's now known that they had broad and flared hip bones, as well as short collarbones and pronounced shoulder joints, that might have given them the appearance of being hunched over when they walked. One theory as to why they were so small suggests that a colony of Homo erectus settled on the island thousands of years ago, after relocating there from Java. Over the next few thousand years, they gradually became shorter, a phenomenon that's been observed in several animals that live on isolated islands. These animals diminished in size thanks to a lack of food on these islands, and since they no longer had to protect themselves from large predators. But this theory has been superseded by the suggestion that they actually evolved from a far more ancient race of humans. There's also the possibility that they aren't a separate race at all, but that they were Homo sapiens who suffered from some form of dwarfism that not only affected their bodies but also the size of their brains. It's now all but certain that Homo floresiensis is indeed a separate human species, though there's still a lack of a lot of information such as where they originated and why they eventually became extinct. 
This discovery has the potential to rewrite a lot of what we know about the evolution of humans through the centuries, especially since the remnants of a similar small race of early humans, called Homo luzanensis, has also been discovered in the Philippines, nearly 3,000 miles from Liangbua Cave. Number 4. It's said that if you're looking to discover a new species of insect, the best place to start looking is your own garden, since new species are being discovered on a daily basis, and not only in the vast jungles of the world, but also by ordinary people, who take the time to look a little closer at the critters that live around their houses. The same can't be said for larger creatures, such as wild cats or other mammals since new species of this kind are usually very hard to find and are often located in hard-to-reach areas that have either never been explored or have only been visited by humans a handful of times. But there is one animal that's best known to the people on the island of Corsica in France for a very long time, but it's only recently been formally studied and surprisingly, it's been classified as a completely new species of mammal known as the cat fox. One of these creatures was once accidentally trapped in a chicken coop on the island in 2008, but it had been seen by people living in the area for a long time before that, and it was considered to be a pest, since they would regularly get into trouble with local shepherds, likely because they were looking for an easy meal. To gain a better understanding of the cat fox, researchers left several sticks containing feline essence in the wild. These cat foxes would find the smell irresistible, and would rub against these sticks, leaving clumps of their fur behind. This could then be sent for genetic testing and surprisingly, they were found to be a completely different species from the European wildcat, which was erroneously thought to have been their closest relative. They found that the cat fox differed from other cats in that they had canine-like teeth that were highly developed, wide ears unlike domestic cats, and short whiskers. They measure around 35 inches from their heads to their tails, which contain several rings and a black tip. Their thick fur has also been found to naturally deter ticks and fleas, unlike domestic cats. It's thought that they remain elusive since they constantly have to stay out of sight of golden eagles that live in that area. But it is not known when or how these creatures arrived on the island, and since they're very low in numbers, they've already been classified as an endangered species. Number 3. Imagine finding out that there's a treasure worth as much as $400 million lying at the bottom of a lake, just waiting to be discovered. This is a rumor that has existed since the American Civil War and still persists today as treasure hunters scour the waters off the coast of Poverty Island in Lake Michigan in search of the mythical treasure. The story originates with Napoleon Bonaparte, who supported the Confederacy during the war since he was interested in the cotton that was produced in the South at the time, much to the dismay of his foreign ministers. Nonetheless, it's said that Napoleon ordered his men to fill numerous wooden chests with gold that were then to be sent through Canada to Lake Michigan, where it was supposed to be loaded onto a schooner and sent to help with the South's war efforts. But as soon as the schooner set out towards its destination, it was spotted by the enemy and a chase ensued. Rather than see the gold fall into the wrong hands, it's said that the ship's crew members tied the chests to each other and threw them overboard just off the coast of Poverty Island, where the chests still remain today. It would seem that this tale was largely forgotten until the 1920s, when a large freighter ran aground near the island. A few tugboats were sent to aid the ship that was moored on jagged rocks. But while doing so, one of the anchors was caught on one of the chains that held the boxes together. The tugboat's crew attempted to bring the boxes to the surface, but they failed to do so, as the boxes broke free from the chains and sank back down below the waters. Sometime later, it was said that a man named Carly Jensen saw a salvage boat in that same area, and he speculated that they were looking for the lost treasure. Before the salvagers could make any inroads into locating the gold, a violent storm broke out and the salvage boat sank, leaving the mystery intact and the supposed gold still lying at the bottom of the lake. Though there's no solid proof that this treasure exists, many people have attempted to find it over the years, but with no success. One such attempt was made by the popular television series Unsolved Mysteries in August of 1994. A camera crew from the program ventured out into the water to take footage of whatever they could find under the water, 
and locals were interviewed in hopes of finding more information on the gold. But that wasn't the case, and no further clues were found. One man who refuses to give up on the treasure is professional diver Richard Bennett, who spent more than $100,000 over a period of 20 years in search of the fabled gold. He believes that since the tale of the treasure has been told for over a century, there has to be some credence to it, and he believes that there's as much as an 85% chance that the gold really does exist. He has since designed a sort of underwater sled that allows searchers to be pulled along the lake bed. He believes this will give him and his team the best chance at finding the treasure, if it really does exist, but they've been unsuccessful so far. His sentiments are echoed by historian Steve Harrington, who's also adamant that the treasure will be found one day. He believes in the rumors since the story is told by many people, but never changes. There are always said to be five wooden chests filled with gold, and they're always lost off the coast of Poverty Island. But there are many skeptics who believe the rumor to be nothing but that, a rumor. Historian Chuck Feltner, who has a lot of experience searching for old shipwrecks in the Great Lakes, believes that while it's an entertaining story to tell, there's no truth to the tale since shipwreck records show no evidence that a schooner sank near Poverty Island during the American Civil War. He adds that the records of shipwrecks at that time were religiously filed, and that if a schooner had indeed sunk in the area, it would be well documented, rather than being a tale told around campfires. Maybe one day someone will be lucky enough to retrieve the massive amount of gold that's said to be at the bottom of Lake Michigan, but for now it remains mere speculation and an unsolved mystery that has captured the imaginations of thousands of people all over the world. Number 2. We've been able to predict the weather fairly accurately for a very long time, and it's undoubtedly saved many ships from being lost at sea, when foul conditions were spotted before they were able to cast off. But there's a legend from Polly's Island in South Carolina involving a figure known only as the Gray Man, who's said to have the ability to sense bad weather coming and that when he spotted, it's best to stay as far away from the water as possible. The story has been around for more than a century, since it dates back to 1822, and it states that a very young sailor who'd been away from home for a very long time was making his way back to his hometown of Polly's Island, where his fiance was waiting for him. He'd been traveling for days, and hence was impatient to get off his horse for a rest once he reached home. He also noticed that a storm was approaching, so he decided to take a shortcut through a thick and boggy marsh. Daylight was fading quickly, and his horse found going through the mud very tough, and before long it became bogged down in the marsh. Realizing that it was in trouble, the horse threw the man into the mud and sped off, leaving him trapped, and he was unable to escape, losing his life in the process. His fiance was understandably devastated by the news of his passing and she could regularly be seen taking walks alone on the beach while she was in mourning. One day, while out walking, she came across a strange figure dressed in grey clothing standing in her path. She thought that she recognized the man, and so decided to walk over to him. To her shock, she realized it was her fiancé. But realizing that this was impossible, she started quizzing him on what was going on, but he didn't answer any of her questions. Instead, he turned to her with a somber expression on his face and warned her that a violent storm was approaching the island and that she had to leave as quickly as she could. Just a moment later, he vanished into thin air, leaving her standing alone on the beach. Once she gathered her senses after her strange encounter, she ran home and told her family what she had just seen and what her fiancé spirit had told her. Her family took her at her word and decided to heed the strange figure's warning. They gathered what supplies they could and fled the island just in time before the storm hit. The storm quickly became a hurricane that decimated the island and all of the houses on it, save for the one belonging to the woman's family. They were able to return to the island after the hurricane passed and insisted that they'd been saved by the young man's spirit. Since then, many people have reported seeing the same figure, still dressed in grey clothing on the beach and he's said to have warned countless people of incoming foul weather, and to this day, many believe that when he is seen, it can only mean one thing. Get away from the water immediately. Number 1. The last time that 36-year-old Carmel Gilmore was seen 
was on the 14th of November, 2017. CCTV security footage shows that she was present in a liquor store depot on Alberni Highway in Parksville, Canada at around 9 p.m. that night, but she disappeared shortly after and has not been seen or heard from since. Staff from the liquor depot would tell investigators that when she was in the store, she seemed confused, disoriented, and paranoid, likely because her boyfriend at the time was in the process of ending their relationship. He was the one who reported Carmel as missing and would later tell investigators that she asked him to accompany her to Little Mountain in her van, which she agreed to do without hesitation. Once they arrived at 10.30 p.m., he got out of the van, thinking that she would do the same, but she ultimately put the van in gear and drove away, leaving him on his own and wondering what was going on. He then realized that his wallet and some of his other belongings were still in the van, but he had no way of stopping her. He made his way back home, and when he hadn't heard from Carmel by the following morning, he filed a missing person report. Most people would jump to the conclusion that Carmel's boyfriend had something to do with her sudden disappearance. But investigators found him to be very cooperative and he was quickly ruled out as a suspect. Despite a thorough search being conducted, nothing more was found until six days later, when Carmel's van, a 2002 Chevy Venture, was discovered abandoned on Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island. It was found in a parking area just a short distance away from a bar called Shady Rest Pub. And when investigators started interviewing people in the area, they learned that the van had been parked in the same spot since the night that she sped away from her boyfriend. Once the van had been located, the first order of business was to search it, and investigators found nothing that indicated that foul play was involved. There were no signs of a struggle, and it seemed as though she merely parked the van, got out and walked away, never to be seen again. Strangely, none of Carmel's belongings were found inside, despite clues being found that indicated she'd been living in it for some time. Her social media accounts were monitored despite her not being very active online, and there's been no activity since her strange disappearance. Barbara Gilmore, Carmel's mother, confirmed that her daughter had been homeless for a while, and she believes that this made her vulnerable, making her an easy target for anyone with nefarious intentions. Barbara believes Carmel did indeed meet foul play, and she's vowed to never stop looking for answers, despite investigators believe that she either disappeared willingly or had an accident of some kind. She attended an interview with a podcast called True North True Crime in December of 2023, and is hopeful that this will bring renewed attention to Carmel's case, and that someone will remember something that will lead to her whereabouts. Carmel is described as having short brown hair, hazel eyes, and standing about 5 foot 6 inches tall. At the time of her disappearance, she weighed about 150 pounds and would be 41 years old today. If you have any information on Carmel's case, you're asked to contact the Oceanside RCMP at 250-248-6111, quoting file number 2017-10474. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.